the doubts, dust away the fears in our lives, that we, Lord, would grab hold of all that you have for us to live out. Bless this morning, Father. We thank you for everything in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> Simon or Jonah, a.k.a. Simon the Fisherman, Renamed by Jesus Cephas, stone, anglicized, or uh, the Greek, uh, rather, uh, Peter. Uh, my father had a saying, uh, King Kook, <laughs> Simple Simon, <laughs> Chief of the Knuckleheads, a.k.a. the Twelve, and, uh, you know, uh, it seemed as if everything the Lord was teaching them for three years went in ear one and out of the other, over their heads, uh, particularly the simple gospel message. Uh, they didn't get it. Like you and I at one point, <laughs> we didn't get it. <laughs> uh, no different from any regenerate human. It's uh, easy to view them uh, in hindsight, uh, critically, forgetting that uh, the Twelve did not have the New Testament Scriptures. They wrote the New Testament Scriptures later, being eyewitnesses of the Lord's first coming, culminating in His glorification, that is, His crucifixion, resurrection, ascension. Uh, they did not have the benefit of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the permanent indwelling Holy Spirit, which came uh, 50 days after the resurrection, uh, with uh, whom, whose help they did write the New Testament. And then thirdly, they did not have, as we read the Gospel accounts, the benefit of, of, of having already seen Jesus crucified and risen, which we know about as we read uh, of their uh, lack of understanding and mistakes. Peter... It was a braggart with no filter and low impulse control. He spoke before he thought, and he acted before he thought. And he was all about himself. Uh, he identified Jesus as the promised Messiah, the Son of God. After which then the Lord lays out the gospel message. The Son of Man will be trained in the hands of sinners, crucified and rise from the dead the third day. To which Pete says to the Lord, don't even say such a thing. Uh, the night before the crucifixion, the Lord says it again. And Pete says, I'll die with you, Lord. We're going down together. And then uh, hours later at the arrest, he starts wielding a sword at the Jewish police uh, arresting party in the Roman SWAT team. <laughs> then, then in the courtyard... Uh, he reverts to the swearing cuss and sailor he'd been before he began following the Lord. But a second look at old Pete, that is his after portrait, is quite the contrast. Uh, we're going to uh, look uh, today mostly at his first epistle, the first chapter, sorry, verse 18. You were redeemed, he writes to believers. You were redeemed. Wow, okay. Uh, from the Greek, to pay a price that is required for the release of one from an obligation. Now, you, uh, how many of us like to watch uh, crime dramas? Uh, whether it's a movie or you got the NCIS, NISC, and all the spinoffs. <laughs> okay, you know, they've been on uh, the number one shows on television for 30 years. I haven't seen any, but um, Ruth watches them all with her mom. Uh, I, lo I love a, a crime uh, movie. Two hours is enough for me, not 20 years, but, uh, you know. Uh, 
So uh, you can't watch one of those crime dramas without a uh, without a kidnapping and a, a ransom required. And of course, uh, they're not going to pay that ransom price. <laughs> I like what uh, Tommy Lee Jones says to his detective whom, uh, who was hostage at one point, uh, whose safety and life uh, Tommy Lee Jones, as his supervisor, valued nothing. <laughs> and he says, I don't, I don't make agreements with hostage keepers, or whatever it is. And uh, so we were held hostage, held hostage by sins, power, consequences, and presence, and helpless to redeem ourselves. Unlike the football player in the Super Bowl, fumbles the ball away, and then later scores a winning touchdown, he redeemed himself. That's all our nature. We want to redeem ourselves. But we can't. <laughs> the guilt of our sin remains. There was a, uh, no, I will say this first, uh, to purchase, to buy back. I have here a uh, coupon from this morning's newspaper, which is as current. Which is uh, as current. The scriptures are as current as today's newspaper, and here's the proof. How about that? And the gospel is as current as today's newspaper. So, uh, the Clairol hair product. Uh, it's, it's of no use to me, but uh, maybe if anybody can, wants it, uh, I'll leave it over here at the table afterwards. So. But it does say, uh, manufacturer's coupon, and uh, one coupon redeemable to the retailer. You are authorized to act as our agent and redeem this coupon in acceptance with one little coupon redemption for the face value. Send a coupon in. They buy back the coupon. <laughs> and so, of course, in biblical times, sadly today, there is still human trafficking rampant across our planet, including in our nation, which was sexual purposes, and it's usually children. Women and children. So, uh, in biblical times, there'd be a slave trading block. Slave prisoners of war were slaves. Uh, they were not released, and so there were a lot of slaves available after uh, any war and in between wars. And they bought and sold on the slave trading market, sadly, in the history of our nation also. And, and, uh, and a human beyond that trade slave, uh, uh, slave trading block, up for bid. Uh, a man could set a, meet the price and purchase that human being legally, but not before God. Walk in the, the slave walk over to the man, the man walk over to the slave. He said, uh, you know, who are you? And he say, uh, well, I just bought your freedom, not you. What do you mean? I'm set you free. I purchase your freedom. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> You're free to live wherever you want and do whatever you want. Being a foreigner in a strange land, no way to make a living, perhaps. Nowhere to go, no people. And uh, he said, uh, can, I, sir, can I work for you? <laughs> you hired anybody? <laughs> and the man said, uh, I guess so. And he said, well, uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll just serve you. You know, I'll be your slave. <laughs> but he said, well, you, but you're free. He said, well, uh, it'd be a voluntary servitude. A bond slave, we call it. Uh, commit himself to life to serve the man who set him free. Hard to fathom in our current comprehension of societal ways. And yet a perfect picture of the redemption that God offers to us. We'll take a closer look in a minute. So you were redeemed and the price was right. <laughs> what was the price? 
uh, verse 19, uh, the precious blood of Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, a lamb without blemish or defect. Well, okay. It says a lot there. Come on, let this. A lamb without defect. The uh, lamb, the sacrificial lamb, is a reference to Passover. So the original Passover, those in slavery in Egypt, would slaughter a lamb without defect or blemish. Symbolic of the promised one is righteousness, no character defect in him. We're born full of them. <laughs> Namely, defiance or distrust of God and uh, in authority, and then no blemish on his record. So he never, he was born without a tendency to do the wrong thing, unlike us, and he never did the wrong thing, unlike us. And uh, that blood from the slaughtered lamb would be put on the doorpost or what was called the, the overhead, the, the mantle of the dwelling place. And anyone, even Egyptian, who would have that blood on that dwelling place and anyone in that dwelling place, death would pass over them that night. But anyone firstborn, without in being in a dwelling with the blood on the door and the post and mantle would die. The death would not pass over them. The, the key for, the, for death passing over was the blood of the lamb. And then Passover was to be commemorated with the meal and the unfermented fruit of the vine. <laughs> As Jesus said uh, the night before the crucifixion, uh, this blood is... Um, Figurative uh, that it was of his shed blood. Do this in remembrance of me until I come again, the second coming. And uh, and that's the price. The shed blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. Now Peter, uh, his brother Andrew, uh, went across the Jordan to the desert, where the prophet John the Baptist was preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And God's promise one from the beginning of time is coming. Get ready. And, uh, and then it says that uh, Jesus arrived on the scene one day. And John says, behold, there he is. This is the one I'm telling you about. I'm not fit to tie sandals. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Passover lamb of God, which we have our term, sacrificial lamb, comes from the, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And his death and shed blood enables the believer in him, in that redemptive act, have death pass over him. Spiritual death, which we would define as a separation from God, and physical death. You say, well, how am I going to escape physical death? Well, <laughs> how about this one? <laughs> a few weeks before he pays for the ransom and rises from the dead, Jesus gives a preview. You know, God's all about previews, common attractions. We all like that. Isn't that funny? God gives previews from Genesis to Revelation. He's good. He's kind of, and, you know, people flock to mediums, uh, you know, they say there's got to be a happy medium somewhere. I think it's Madame Marie in <laughs> Asbury, New Jersey. You know, uh, but uh, God has told us so much of, uh, of what's to come. And he gives us previews. And, uh, and so we have the... Uh, uh, give me a second here. Uh, the... <laughs> The, the lamb, uh, 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 again, uh, Andrew and another disciple, uh, John writes, uh, 
So uh, they hear John uh, telling about the one that was promised to come and comes and he's the name of God. And uh, so, of course, Andrew's brother is Simon the fisherman, chief, chief of the knuckleheads. And so, and he tells him, Simon, we, we have found the Messiah. He's here. The one promised from the beginning of time. That. We'll go back to Andrew and his other disciple friend in a moment. And uh, so, how did John identify Jesus, the Lamb of God? And that is the redemption price, just as it was at the temple. You made the pilgrimage on Passover, and you had purchased a lamb without blemish. Or a defect. And uh, they weren't cheap. <laughs> For which uh, the Lord cleansed that temple, beginning of his ministry and, uh, and the beginning of his final week before his glorification, also. And there is the purchase price to ransom us, to purchase us to belong to God. Thirdly, Jesus was chosen or foreknown by God before creation. Now, here, two weeks ago, uh, uh, so uh, uh, a few weeks ago, explained that very well that uh, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus was God's plan all along. He only has one plan in theology, it's called. The old terminology, the decree of God, God's master plan for the unfolding of all the events in human history of the universe. And of course he knew if he created uh, humans, that they would be subject to corruption and in fact they would be corrupted. He knows all things future possible and future actual all at once. He knows all things including his foreknowledge of all things. And that the son would be sacrificed. He'd be the only one qualified, born without a human father, or that a tendency to do the wrong thing, our sin nature, that we inherit. He would not, and he did not, he would be righteous and therefore be qualified as our perfect substitute. Before creation, all along in Eden. And Adam and Isha would fall and need to be redeemed, not brought, not just to be brought back, but to be bought back, to be brought back. Not a backup plan. From verse 2, God's foreknowledge, Peter's epistle. Always, God always has known whoever you are to know the Lord and that you need redemption. God has always known those who have come to him because God is timeless, though we are not. Now, thirdly, spoiler alert, uh, Jesus was raised from the dead <laughs> and glorified. Uh, and uh, so, uh, Verse 21, through him you believe in God. It is through Jesus, the, the promised one, his death and resurrection, who God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so, uh, 50 days after the uh, denial of Peter, the, 51 days, uh, I never knew him. <laughs> and uh, the Lord restores him on the beach uh, with the holes in his hands and feet, you know. And uh, tells Peter, uh, you, he had gone back to fishing, and uh, the Lord re reminded him, I called you to follow me. You know, uh, that still applies. <laughs> I, need, you need to, I need you to feed my sheep. You're going to feed the other sheep. And, uh, and, uh, and, and Peter becomes permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit, as all believers are now, Romans 8 9. And... He stands up before the crowd gathered for Pentecost, uh, pilgrimaging again from all over the Mediterranean. Uh, people uh, who uh, were listening uh, to uh, 
Uh, those in their own language, they heard him miraculously by the Spirit. Acts 2, verse 23, to Jews, uh, to the Jews, uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth was handed over to you by Gentiles, uh, the Romans, uh, by God's um, deliberate plan, deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, as the Romans, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Well, Peter had his own part in that, too. <laughs> he left that out, but uh, uh, he had no problem letting them all know, uh, uh, you're all guilty. <laughs> And verse 24, first two words, my favorite. Anybody know my favorite words of Scripture? Oh, very good. My wife knows. <laughs> but God! <laughs> Remember we talked about it. You wanted, to, you wanted the bad news first, right? Didn't you say that last time? But God raised him from the dead. Because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him, citing the 16th Psalm. In other words, it was prophesied. So it was impossible for Jesus' resurrection from the dead to not happen. One of my favorite verses, too. It was impossible for people to go, I don't know, can a person rise from the dead? You know, uh, you know uh, it was impossible, Peter says, for Jesus not to rise from the dead. So... Now, uh, Peter preaches his boldly before the multitudes, and uh, roughly about 3,000 people accepted the message that day and were saved and baptized. Not a bad outreach. <laughs> talk, talk about a uh, successful evangelistic outreach. How many did you have? Uh, 3,000. 3,000 attended? Uh, well, yeah. How many got saved? 3,000. <laughs> well, a pretty good start for the church age, I would say. And uh, you know, so we would have faith and hope. So our faith and hope is in Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, God provides for us. The faith is that the episteo in the Greek to trust. We trust in the risen Jesus for salvation. And hope, Elpis, to look forward to something guaranteed you that you can't wait for. You just look up for it. It sustains you through the sufferings that we endure in this life until we are removed from them. I have had a, a man named Thaddeus in our church plant, suffered severely arthritis and other ailments, and uh, tried everything, all the new experimental pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical medications and everything, and uh, they took a toll on him. With their side effects, and he uh, went to be with the Lord. And he said, that is, uh, doesn't have arthritis anymore. <laughs> the Lord took him from it. And that's the whole point uh, of redemption. Uh, we will be removed from sin's presence one day. It's, it's effects or consequences, and in fact, today, from its power, which we shall see now in a moment. So, verse, uh, no, fourthly, I'll say, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, the truth of the gospel. And so you respond to the gospel positively. Uh, to incline, to pre to exercise trust and that message of Jesus' death for you. He paid the ransom for you to set you free from sin's grip, its consequences, and its one day its presence. And and so there's a purification. <laughs> you were washed in the blood of the Lamb of God. Wash clean of the guilt. And uh, and so there's this uh, there's this transformation that should be taking place. And uh, so the uh, passage 
kind of makes its way back to its introduction, verse 17, that uh, we are to live out your time in reverent fear of the Father who evaluates our works in fear of displeasing Him. And so our ransom price should motivate us to give our lives back to Him, just like that bond slave from the slave trading market who's freed, that we would serve Him. And, uh, he ha and acknowledge uh, and respond to the claim He has on our lives, on our soul. You know, He has a claim on our soul. What do we have what our soul has? It's our life that we live till, the, till we go to be with Him and our defects are finally gone. And we in the process, the sanctification <coughs> process, living out your time as foreigners. Well, that is in this world's shifting landscape of beliefs, values, and situational ethics. With a conscience sensitive to not displease the Father. Purified by obeying the truth. Quid est veritas? The Roman governor asked Jesus uh, rhetorically as he stood before him. Who could say what the truth is? And Jesus was the truth standing before him. You know, uh, so Pilate was a Pluralist, a syncretist, a humanist. Just like a, an American today. No different. We've become Rome. Which fell from within after about 300 years of power. Now, the sixth chapter of Romans lays out this idea of uh, the slave trader and the redeemed, as it tells us, uh, sin shall no longer be your master. Uh, and then, uh, when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey. Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience which leads to righteousness. And then you have been set free, verse 18, from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Verse uh, 19, just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you now shamed? Well, those things result in death, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life. And so we uh, serve a new master. Master Jesus. And... Uh, we owe him, and so we serve him. And so Peter then writes, in light of all that, in uh, verse 22, uh, love one another deeply from the heart. Interesting phraseology. Uh, Peter was an emotional guy. Is that what he's talking about? Not exactly. The heart, the inner man, including the will. Uh, so uh, the Greek is agapao. From that, uh, the verb form, unlike the human uh, affection, uh, brotherly love, our city's named after. Uh, scripture affirms its place. Uh, the feeling of affection that, it, that comes from practicing agapao. Uh, the unselfish, self-sacrificing treatment, not a feeling. Treatment of others according to what's in their best interest. 
Philippians 2 uh, calls us to. And, uh, you know, you can't give what you don't got. <laughs> so we must receive it through the message of the cross, of course, the greatest the demonstration, Romans 5 8, of Akapao is that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And in fact, so there was nothing in us to require Christ to die for us. It was completely unconditional. And the, and the term Akapao comes originally, it was an obscure Greek term that simply meant to salvage. So, uh, with an I, uh, or with this, uh, uh, regularly uh, divesting our home of things we don't need anymore. <laughs> uh, she, she said, uh, do you still really need your college textbook on logic? And I'm like, uh, let me think about it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, broke a piece of furniture, and it goes out to the curb Sunday night. Well, yeah, I'm sure we got things going out tonight, right? <laughs> But before the trash uh, collector comes in the morning, it's gone. I look at the one's gone. What happened? Uh, the pet's right. The pickup truck came in the night. And the old man uh, looked at that and said, uh, I can fix that, or I can sell it, or I can repair it, or I can use it. So Romans 3, quoting the Psalms, tells us that we are useless to God in our natural state. We are completely useless to God. Now, what does that mean, useless to God? Well, we're not useless to ourselves. Well, we weren't created to serve ourselves. We were created to serve God, and we're incapable of doing that. In our natural state, we are broken and useless. And yet God says, I can salvage them. And this word save comes from the same word. I can save them and fix them up. And make them useful to me. And so the term Akapao comes. That uh, you receive that free gift that through that rent, trust in the price paid, the ransom, to free you. And then you're able to find yourself as God's servant, truly empowered by his spirit to do his will. And serve him and please him and find in that your own satisfaction, your pleasure. Who would have ever thought, right? And yet deep down inside of us, we all have this 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 this, this idea that we would we would like to perform heroic acts and help other people and be God's servant. Be a representative of God. But we can't, apart from the trusting in the message of the cross and then the indwelling spirit that makes the transformation possible. This uh, redemption takes place in other aspects in a way. Uh, I, have a, I have a godfather. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, I'm not Italian, neither is he. <laughs> I was Irish. <laughs> My uncle Joe is uh, 95 years old. He's in uh, Paoli Hospital right now. Uh, with a broken shoulder from falling, but uh, he's got a team. You know, uh, him and my my aunt. My aunt Jean's 103 and in good health. Wow. She can't remember uh, the beginning of the conversation at the end of your conversation. Well, other than that, she's in excellent health. So how about that. And she's my godmother. Fairy godmother is a very important part, uh, character in the Cind story of Cinderella. We won't get into that at this point. <laughs> but my, my uncle Joe is my godfather. But they, had, they had no children, but they did have 10 nieces and nephews. I'm sorry, 12. <laughs> 12 nieces and nephews, to which they are godfather and godmother to almost every one of us, I think. So, <laughs> so they had... They have a team of 10 people. I'm mostly just on the thread, and if I needed to fill in uh, which they needed someone this morning, I, had, I told them I, I had to work. I uh, could not make it, but uh, all doing the caregiving, 
all consulting with the doctors and nurses and and then uh, others with my aunt in the assisted living home where they live, I'm making sure she's okay as they're used to having each other next to each other in their old age. And so there's this relationship, you know, of being responsible for someone who is in need. Because so, uh, of course, so if anything were to happen to my parents, then uh, my uncle and my aunt, they would have taken me into their home. That's the point of being a godfather or a godmother. But then what's the flip side of that? When they're all in need, in need of care. So then the godson has to be willing to help and be part of that. And so he's got uh, maybe near 12 god children that are doing that for him in his time of need. I think also the kinsman redeemer of a widow uh, who in a time where women were not only unable to be employed or make a living, as they were considered second-class citizens, property even, and no way to have an income, the brother of her husband would be required to take her in, into his home, uh, legally, and provide for her a picture of what God does for us in his son. Be part of that family just as we become part of God's family and cared for. And now Peter says, return it on one another. The night before the crucifixion in the upper room, John who was there tells us in his 13th chapter, Jesus said, I have a new commandment. Oh, imagine that. That is the 11th commandment. <laughs> And I'm sure their ears perked up and their eyes widened. Wow, what's this one? <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe they're like, oh, no, another one, you know. <laughs> we haven't done well with the first ten, you know what I mean? <laughs> now we got another one. Uh, what is it, Lord? Huh? Uh, you know, um, our cat Scrapper, you know, if he hears this strange noise, his ears swivel like uh, like a uh, radio antenna or something. I don't know how he does it. I wish I could do that. But I'm, if they had cat ears, they would be swiveling. What is it, Lord? Verse thirty-four: As I have loved you, or practiced agape toward you, so you must practice it toward one another. Verse thirty-five: By this shall all know that you are my disciples if you practice agape toward one another. It's past tense, as I have practiced it toward you. Now, just as prophecies in the past tense are so, because they're certain to happen as if they already have, remember God's foreknowledge, to him they already have. Right? Not to us, but to him. What's more important? Thank God. God's got it all together. I mean, it's not up to you and I. So it's as it, as it already has happened, all prophecies. To God. <laughs> So they're that certain. So the Lord says, as I have loved you, that uh, is the, he also said, the greater love has no man for another, that he what? Lay down his life, which he does the next day. See. Talk about self-sacrifice that he calls us to for one another. And that's the greatest demonstration, of course, of agape, Romans 5 eight. Self-interest is replaced by pleasing our resurrected Savior, and then our self-interest is replaced with the interest of others, Philippians 2.4, as we said. Now... We consider we're not we're not to be all about ourselves, though Peter had been, and no longer is. He's the one who boldly proclaims uh, what you did, killing uh, you know fifty days ago, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> you all had a part in getting him killed. Remember the the mob in the in Pilate's courtyard, turned by the religious leaders against him after all he failed to deliver the political insurrection, a revolution that everybody expected from the Messiah 
He instead, instead of leading a revolt at the governor's palace, he went to the temple every day and attacked the false teachings of the religious leaders. By the end of the week, they said, that ain't happening. Again? To the temple again? And so they, turned, they were easily turned on him because most of them were only in it for the political revolution. But Jesus' first coming was for a spiritual revolution. My kingdom is in the hearts of my followers, he told the governor. It's a spiritual revolution I'm leading. And to ignite it, he had to be crucified and resurrected. And he was. <laughs> and nothing could stop it. It's the plan of God. Now, Peter boldly says that to all of them. 3,000 believers are saved. The self-centered knucklehead had been spiritually, supernaturally, by the message of the gospel, transformed by his ransom, his, his redemption, by the risen Christ into a powerful force in the newborn church age, pastor of the first church, Jerusalem, masterful expositor of the Old Testament with the understanding the Spirit of God gives him, the mind of Christ, the apostolic teachings he lays out, and the benefits of faith in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for all, including me and you, that's verse 20, for your sake. Yes. <laughs> it's not all about you, but it's about Jesus and you. So that we would be similarly transformed by faith in this message. He's living a redeemed life with a new master, not oneself, but the risen Savior, Jesus. Practicing the unselfish sacrifice for him to one another. Can we live that? Can you see yourself in Simon the fisherman, Simon bar -Jun? You know, in my natural state, I was all about myself. <laughs> I was bragging. I had low impulse control. I cussed like a sailor. I didn't understand the gospel though it had been run by me. Until one day I said yes. <laughs> I cried out to, I decided that Jesus was alive, risen from the dead, that he died for me, that he wanted to redeem me, and I asked him to. <laughs> I cried out to save me, and uh, he did. <laughs> now, uh, what are we going to do with this? message of redemption. Can you see yourself? You know, uh, it's funny because part of Peter's problem was, uh, you know, he thought that he was good. I'm good, apart from Jesus. You know, and we all do, to some extent. You know, I think about the human condition, the most common defect or sin, I think is not alcohol abuse, <laughs> immorality or abusiveness. What do you think it is? Pride. <laughs> Very good. My star pupil. <laughs> Self-righteousness. We think I'm good. Embodied uh, first and foremost in the Gospels by who? The religious leaders, the Pharisees, and they wanted Jesus dead because they thought they were good, because they had wealth and power, <laughs> and the wealth that the power brought to them, and he threatened both, <laughs> and they had a sense of, of righteousness of their own, of which we, <laughs> they were deluded, and none of us do, but we can get it from the gospel, and we can give it out. We can live it out. And uh, will you do that? Let's respond. Let's pray. Our Father, we give thanks for this gospel. This message of the ransom paid, the redemption price, to set us free from self-righteousness, from pride, from thinking we're good apart from you, from living to please ourselves. 
to be all about ourself and instead to be all about our Savior and put the interest of others before our own in response to what you have done for us. The silent moment of prayer just between you and the Lord. Father, empower us to the rest of this day to serve you in the power of your spirit to practice our kapa'u on others, on one another, beginning with one another, to glorify our Savior so that others will know. Through him we ask. Everyone say. Amen. Amen.